Baxley, and I'm here representing Ocean Current Energy. It's a, a, a open ocean energy development company. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to kind of do is to provide uh, some information on both the similarities and the additional challenges of taking the tidal system and putting it out into the open ocean where you could actually utilize these more uh, larger currents that are further offshore. So I'm going to go over some of that stuff today, the comparisons, and then delve in a little bit more into the specifics of some of the challenges that await all of you that think uh, you might want to do that. <laughs> and there are a lot. So um, first thing is, uh, the, they're both similar but they're different, right? So they, they have both are audacious <laughs> objectives and attempts to install complex systems in a uh, diverse and inaccessible environment. So anyone that's an ocean engineer realizes it takes a special kind of crazy to spend all this time and money to design something and you throw it out in the water to test it where you can't easily get to it and it has all these things going against it. So um, it's a very interesting thing and that's what, part of what I like to do about it. And I've done this for over 30 years now. I just passed the 30 year mark of actually as an ocean engineer and 25 of those were in the Florida current just off of Florida, both for the Navy and for the university. So I've been out there every day pretty much. So that's why I want to pass some of this stuff along and explain the great areas that I have. So um, now this has been successful in some offshore oil and civil engineering projects, but again, that's a different type of offshore environment where they don't have these persistent high currents and other environments that, uh, that you do when you're trying to generate electricity from the, the flowing water. Um, there's persistent high water velocities that I've just mentioned, dynamic nearshore conditions, and they have challenges. So the common issues regarding corrosion, structures, loads, insulation, maintenance, all that sort of stuff, that's common to both. But again, there are differences when you're you know, several, tens of miles offshore versus in a channel where you can, can access it a little bit easier. And then the deployment locations and associated environmental conditions pose unique challenges. So I'll just very briefly, because I'm sure most of the title people know this already, there's a uh, the issue with tidal is that the higher in the latitudes, the larger the tidal ranges, and so that's where you get the better velocity. And so just shown here, these are some of the, uh, the major areas where uh, the tidal resources are. And they're typically above 30 or 40 degrees in latitude. Whereas if you look at the uh, global ocean currents, typically around the gyres, and um, there's three different places. And we also did the energy um, evaluation, you know, <coughs> 500 watts per, per square meter was our metric. <clears throat> and there was three main places around the, uh, the globe that not only had relatively high power densities, but they are also near load centers, right, large load centers. So we had the Croatia over here in Japan, which is obviously a very high load center, if you've ever been there. Southeast um, US, off of Miami, same thing. And then the Eulis, the part of the Eulis that comes down on the, uh, the eastern side of South Africa. So those are the three places where not only is there the resource, it has the power density, and it's close to someone who cares, okay? So um, those are the three places that um, we've been focusing on, and because we're in Florida, I'm gonna speak specifically on the Gulf Stream as far as the environmental conditions, um, because they're fairly similar. Um, and you also notice that, again, these are between 20 and 30 degrees of uh, latitude, so it's closer down near the equator where we don't have as much of a tidal resource, but we can tap into these global resources. All right, so what are the challenges? So we have deep water. So instead of tens of meters, we're in hundreds of meters. Uh, distance from shore, so we're, you know, tens of miles or tens of kilometers instead of in a, you know, relatively close to shore. Continuous high flows. Uh, we don't get a slack tide, right? It's just 24 seven. Uh, prime flow is near the surface, as she mentioned. There's a lot of places that, um, you know, the surface is right near the, power is right near the surface, but if you're in deep water, you know, how do you get there? And then tropical storms, as we all know. So my daughter and I got on the plane a couple hours after our power came on, and I think that Bruce also did. So um, anyway, those are the challenges that we have to deal with, right? Which aren't typically um, present with tidal flows. Now, what are the advantages? Well, <laughs> the advantages are deep water, distance from shore, continuous high flows, prime flow near the surface, but not tropical storm. That's not an advantage for anyone, I don't think, except not even the insurance industry. So the thing about deep water, and I'll explain the advantage of these, um, of these four things. It's uh, you take what's against you and you turn it towards your advantage, right? We'll talk about that here in, in just a moment. 
And then the technical issues, obviously. So transport and deployment, because again, you're further away and you're in deeper water where anchoring is not as easy, so you have to use BP vessels, that sort of stuff. The control systems, which I'll talk about in a little while. Um, very large device hydrodynamics. So, um, you know, as she said, you need to scale to get more power. So if you're using this for grid connect, they need to be large by definition. So you have large forces, you need to deal with that, which is a, a tidal concern as well, but you can pretty much put a gravity structure down, whereas offshore in hundreds of meters, you have to do alternatives. Um, complex and unique moorings, because of that reason. Power transmission back to shore, again, we have tens of miles to get back to shore, and the various losses in the power transmission and that sort of thing. Multiple device integration, so if you have an array of these, how in, in hundreds of meters of water do you connect them all together? Um, and then maintenance repair and then vessel traffic. Um, because on the open ocean, most people just set the autopilot and play Xbox as opposed to when they're going through channels and stuff. I think they're a little more attentive, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So the research you're talking about specifically is the, the uh, Gulf Stream and more specifically the Florida Current, which is a portion of the Gulf Stream that goes between the Florida Peninsula and the Bahamas. It's a western boundary current, which means that the core is shifted towards the west, and, um, and it's concentrated near the surface. So that is one of the challenges, because to get in the core, we're in about 300 to 400 meters of water. Um, and that, again, that's here. Over off of Japan, the water is much deeper. Off of Euless, it's a little more shallow, but they don't have as high velocities. And this is a one-year um, measurement of uh, ADCP velocities. 300 meters of water, and this top one just shows the entire period. You see that up near the surface, as we expected, um, there are higher velocities, and then this is just a zoom in of the summer period, where that's when we really get some high velocities, but again, you see the variability in it. So, um, so from a design perspective, when you have something out there that's fairly inaccessible, you have to, uh, to work with that. Um, the other question I usually get is, what's the persistence of the Gulf Stream? And all this talk of global warming and all this sort of stuff, right? And so, what's good news is in 1890, um, Pillsbury went out and he moored his steam powered sailing ship in the Gulf Stream for about a year, moved back and forth, and made measurements. And his profile very well matches the profiles that have been done in the last few years. Um, so, even though it's not nearly the resolution to answer some of the questions that people may want to know, in general, the core, which is this. Uh, this line here is pretty much where it has been for the last hundred plus years, so that's good news, I guess. So speaking of the current, so in tidal, this is this is an animation of the tidal currents in Fort Pierce Inlet, which is near Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute in Fort Pierce. So this is in about 20 meters of water, and obviously it's sped up, <laughs> but this just Gives you an idea of, you know, the, as you, again, you well know, top to bottom current speeds, pretty much the same magnet, magnitude, and changes direction um, on a daily basis. So this is a type of profile that, that you typically have to use. Out in the Gulf Stream, this, these are the profiles that, uh, that we usually deal with. So again, this is a thousand feet of water out here. And so you see there's a large, there are, you know, several hundred meters of, uh, relatively high velocity flow, and then down near the bottom, it's, it, it drops off, right? So that's why I'm saying that offshore, you have the high velocity near the surface, then down below, there's, a, there's not that much. So the way that we can use that as, to our advantage is, since even though we don't have a slack tide to work on these things when the water's not flowing, we can always go under the current and work on the seafloor, or close to the seafloor, in these lower velocities. And then it really reduces our drag and power UV technology and all that sort of stuff. We can do all of our maintenance on the bottom under the current. The other thing is when storms come by, we can hide from them, hide from the storm surge. And I'll show that in a graph in just a minute. Over in the corner, that's uh, we also have CODAR systems out where we're measuring the surface currents. And so it's interesting that if you notice right through here, this is the center line of the of the uh, Florida Strait. But we also have these shoals on either side, the Miami Terrace and the Bahama Bank. And so we have these eddy effects going along either side, so we need to keep that in mind when we're working. And, which has become very obvious lately, is at some point, it's gonna get you, right? 
So these are the hurricane tracks from 1851 until about two years ago. We haven't had the big ones on yet. But the bottom line is, if you're working anywhere over here, if you don't think of hurricanes, you're as silly as living down there. So, um, so that's one of the things we have to do. So to that end, we really, really try to get out and measure the hurricanes when they come out. Like last week, I called up Paul and I'm like, man, I need some battery packs like by the end of the week now. I need to get out before the storm comes, tropical wind warnings kick in, and they won't go out with me. They won't take me out on a ship. And so he sent me the batteries. We went out and threw one in the core of the Gulf Stream. And so I was going to go out next week and get it, but now Maria's running around. So I'm kind of, I'm just going to let it ride and see what we get from there. So this was when Sandy went by. And even though you hear all about Sandy up here, it did come within a few hundred miles of South Florida. And because of its size, it still affected us and it still affected the Gulf Stream. So this is a typical plot that we get down there. So um, for some reason in Excel, I screwed up, so the time goes backwards. But So before the, uh, the eye made its, its uh, closest point of approach, the wind's coming out of one direction, and then suddenly it switches, comes out the other. And this just shows the pressure, which that's the CPA there as the storm came by. So this was our CODAR um, from that that uh, event, it'll play. Well, anyway, so this was the code heart, and it showed a persistent eddy right here on shore. And so we went, and then it suddenly stopped in the middle of the storm. Well, we went up there, and this is why, because it just it just ate away the shoreline, not only where our code heart system was, but part of A1A through Fort Lauderdale back then. So that was really, the erosional damage is what we got in Fort Pierce, I mean, in, I'm sorry, Fort Lauderdale. But the interesting part was what it actually did to the Gulf Stream. And so you see the wind is blowing um, from the east right now, and because of that wind, it's, it's, it was starting to accentuate the velocity. When it suddenly switched back to the west, you can see what it does to at least the upper 100 meters of, uh, of the Gulf Stream. It basically pushes it back, right, because of that forcing to the, to the right of the wind. And you can see how it just twists, twists the top of the Gulf Stream, reduces it, and this here is the uh, difference between the predicted and measured tide levels in Mount Port of Miami. So not only did the velocity slow down, but all that water had to go somewhere, and so it, it filled up, you know, it backflowed and increased the, uh, increased the ports. And then once, <coughs> once the uh, storm passed and everything started to come back, but we still had these really weird twistings of the profile and stuff. So, one of the things to take away from this is that if you do have a device near the surface and a, and a large storm comes by, not only do you have the large wave, wave effects that could affect your devices, but your velocities will, will either speed up or go down. So what do you do? That's what I was saying, you go under and you hide because there's still a persistent, constant flow down about 200 meters or so, which is below the effects of the waves, but you're still in that core of the Gulf Stream, right? So you're still making power because that's the time you want power during a storm when it's passing. Um, and this is just an idea, another display of real play. I have a bunch of leopard pit here somewhere. Mm -hmm. So this is just a top view, and the thing is, these are out in about 1,000 or 300 meters of water. These were only in 200 meters of water, and, there's, and that's, the, that's the problem with putting it too close to a shelf. If you get all these refractions and everything, and it starts to affect the flow, it starts to create these small-scale vortices, and it can affect your equipment. So I guess all I'm saying is, uh, you really need to, to keep all these large-scale oceanographic issues in mind um, when you're deploying your devices. And I think this is a, yeah, it looks like one of my things from my class. Well, anyway, this was just a code card during Matthew, and it shows where the, the currents actually fold back on themselves. Trust me. <laughs> So in the interest of time, I'll just do that. So this was the concept in 2008 when uh, the state of Florida and DOE provided money to um, Florida Atlantic University. And so, you know, how ambitious, how ambitious it is. It has all these devices out here. We're cracking water for hydrogen. We're doing all kinds of stuff. We have cold water pipelines coming in to provide cold water air conditioning for South Florida. All this sort of stuff, right? And so they actually obtained a lot of money for that. And when I went over as part of FAU and started that, this is kind of what it looked like to me, right? I was like, I was like really? So you've got this grandiose design. We don't even know the first thing about getting these persistent presences out there. But it reminded me of these, these old uh, 
things where, oh, in 2038, we're going to be flying to Mars and we're going to have space stations and stuff. Now, eventually, we did do all that stuff, but it certainly wasn't as grandiose in the beginning as what we wanted to think, but it's good to dream. So, so just really quickly, um, so these are the, uh, the forces in a very cartoon, <laughs> simplified um, version of the challenges you need when, when you do need to moor something, we just say 400 meters of water, all the sweet spots up here close to the surface, and you have all these other things to do. So you've got variable velocity, which we've already shown. You have pitch surge and yaw from the waves. Um, and most of the time, you just let that ride unless there's a storm and then you hide from it. Otherwise, you have to deal with it. You have drag and torque, obviously, from the generators. Um, the operating range could be 150 meters. You can't get much closer to that because the Gulf Stream is also like a super highway in that area. So you've got, you've got deep draft hose, and you've got other kinds of vessels coming through. You've got naval assets coming through. And so we really can't get in that sweet spot of the 50 meters. Um, so this is kind of our working range. We come down and we hide at 200 meters during storms. And the other thing is you need these long scope moorings. You just can't have a TLP in there, or a tension length platform in there because of the drag loads on that, right? So you need to moor either a single or at most a two point mooring line. And just to fall back on that, so you have scope, and then anyone that's done that sort of thing, you, know, you have the chain and the anchor and all that other sort of stuff. And then trying to get a power cable through all that chain onto the bottom, it's a non-starter. So you need a separate power cable. And that has drag, and that has management issues. So going deeper, there's all these other challenges. And so there are a few companies out there, including Ocean Current Energy, who have some concepts of mooring these devices. Now, this is a very early concept. Very, <laughs> I'm not going to do this, but it does show the tethered aspects of having these devices up in the water column. This is the FAU turbine. It's a prototype turbine they're working on. This is a Qantas. They have a dual rotor system. And then this is a Anadarko. Just again, other companies are trying to come up with ways. First step, generate electricity. But the thing is, generating is only a very small part of the battle, right? You have to get this stuff out there and make sure that you can uh, maintain it and retain it. So what we've come up with, again, very conceptually, at um, with Ocean Current Energy and working with FAU are these uh, caisson arrays. It's called a coin and slot. So you have a core module here, which I'll explain in just a second. You have your generator aspect down here, and they're nestable. So you can have one core module where you do your buoyancy control and your power conditioning and all that sort of stuff, and then you can just add on these modules, okay? And as you notice, it's on a single point mooring. So in that case, you're like, well, that's just like most of the other things that we've ever seen. Well, the trick is doing in situ maintenance. So what if the generator goes out, you're down 200 meters in five knots current, how do you go down and do that, right? And so what we've come up with, it's similar to aerial refueling, where you have a persistent high current, right? So we're gonna use that to our advantage. So we lower these devices down and into this receptacle here, goes down the inside, and then once it's inside, is that thing rotating? Anyway, once it's inside, you deal with it, and hopefully this, I'm sorry, my figure rotated, so. Pieces. Um, so the, if you, everybody turns your head. As the module comes in, it's get captured in the core module, and then it can be directed either of these three ways into where it's gonna be locked and, and then you know, engaged. And then if something happens to it, you can move it back out, come back in, grab it, and take it back out. So it's basically, you can plug it in, bring it back out, it's a coin and slot. So this is something that um, we're working on. We have some funding from the state of Florida to, to further develop that. And, um, and so that's what we're gonna be working on for the next year or so, is building a scale model of this going out and trying to actually verify if this sort of remote intervention can work in a high flow, hundreds of meters <laughs> off of the sea floor, offshore, okay? And then the last thing about offshore, which I know you'll have that in uh, title as well, but down here in the tropical, we have the living reefs and all that sort of stuff. We've got to get the corals across the beach, I mean the cables across the beach. And that's a big deal. So fortunately, Lake Worth, Florida, they two things. They have their own municipal power plant, so they can they can take the power directly. And they also have an abandoned 30 inch, 9,000 foot long water discharge pipe that we're investigating working with them to run our, our shore cables through that pipe out to an offshore junction box, and then we go from there out to the various devices. So you also have to be able to get across these living reefs because 
I know it's difficult shoring things in you know, more higher latitudes, but down where the, you've got you know, fan coral and stuff waving around, they, they really don't like you knocking that stuff over. So um, anyway, that's, that's just really a quick summary of all the, the challenges of, of taking the title of the device, which has its own long list of challenges, and taking it to deep water and throwing it and trying to get it to work. So, so anyway, that's, that's all. <laughs> trying to put a test site off of um, Fort Lauderdale and we've been dealing with bone to boa for over five <coughs> years now and we essentially we finally got to the lease we got the EA but the conditions were so restrictive where we were because we're on the Miami Terrace we just canceled the whole thing and we're starting over because they're just unbelievably restrictive on what they want you to do offshore to put in just a simple mooring in the cable so that's a, a huge challenge is the regulatory and that's why I didn't get close because it take 15 hours not 15 minutes to go well, sort of the next step is uh, insurance. Uh, yeah. Hey, well, that's why that's when I started off. If you're crazy enough to throw it in the water, then you just gotta. You know, first time you'll break it, second time you'll lose it. If you get to the third time, you're good to go. So. Yeah, the Irish yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the Wright brothers didn't insure their planes. So. But uh, yeah, that's that's uh, the business aspects are yeah. important as well. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Uh, what what size is the prototype going to be? So right now we're using a meter and a half rotor, only because we don't have the vessel sufficient to go out and, and deploy them any larger. And we also have a test device set up that we can we mount a, the rotor onto a, um, a pontoon boat in the, in the intercoastal water right down there. And we just drive back and forth so we can test the rotor and different things inshore before we go offshore and try, you know. Because once you get in the current, you got a tiger by the tail, right? So. Um, it's much better to either push or tow these things where you can come off it and stop and reduce all the drag loads if something goes wrong. So eventually we're looking at a 10 meter. Each one of those would be a 10 meter coin, if you will. And we're looking at at least 100 kilowatts per three unit module to begin with. And then obviously it goes from there. But scaling increases the drag and all that weight and all that other sort of stuff. So starting small and then hopefully getting large. So. Yes, sir. Set up on a single point more? Yes. Wow. That's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Most impressive. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Well, I think we're going to have to. Yes, ma'am.